you are going to be sick of my face, but hopefully it'll all be worth it in the end. Hello again, episode 27 of the Always Better Than Yesterday interview sessions. Attempt number, I've lost count, probably number six. Attempt number six, this conversation will happen and it will be hugely, hugely valuable. Um, I am absolutely convinced of that. So, so here we go. Episode 27 of the Always Better Than Yesterday interview sessions. Um, and if this is the first time you've ever joined me um, for an Always Better Than Yesterday interview session, let me just say thank you for joining. I appreciate your time and your attention, and I hope to add you some great value. Um, if you are a returning Always Better Than Yesterday watcher and listener, then please do drop me a blue love heart emoji. Let me give you a virtual fist bump and appreciate you. Um, these these interview sessions, I've been very fortunate to speak with a number of awesome people. Tonight's going to be no different. They're all about understanding the habits and the mindset behind successful and inspiring people. And the, the person I'm speaking to tonight is definitely, definitely inspiring. And I can finally see the ad button. So this is going to work. Fantastic. So I'll give a brief introduction. Um, I was on Instagram and one of my posts was liked by this account called Leader Surf. And I was like, no, 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 that can't be real. That that leadership and surfing, that just sounds too good to be true. So I checked out the account and I just fell in love with what I saw. And I reached out to the, the founder and I said, look, can we talk? I need to understand a little bit more about you and where that idea sort of came from. Anyway, uh, Brian uh, and I, we had a great, great chat. And I was like, I have to share him with you. And I have to understand a little bit more about his mindset and, and um, you know, how he sees the world of leadership and where, you know, leadership a leader surf really um, positions itself within the leadership development world. Um, so here we go. I'm finally pleased to say that it looks like I'm about to be able to bring Brian on. We had some problems on Sunday night. wasn't going to let me bring him on. Um, there's a reason. I don't know why we've had problems, but whoever is watching this live stream right now or catching up on replay or on the podcast or YouTube, just know that this is for you. OK, and hopefully it adds you a great deal of value. Please do ask your curious question. I certainly will be. So here we go. Adding. Oh, always believe. Always believe. This will happen. So this is what was happening on Sunday. It was going adding, 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 adding to the point it says failed. So I'm, fingers crossed that's not going to happen. Although it is taking a while. Oh, come on. Okay, Brian. Let's try again. So habits and mindset. Hopefully you'll hear something in tonight's conversation that that you'll be able to take into your own journeys and um, something practical. If, if, come on, come on. One step at a time. We are one step closer than we were 10 minutes ago. Brian's got two phones lined up there. I can just imagine one of them is going to go through the window in a minute if this doesn't work. <laughs> Why is it saying adding continuously? Come on, Facebook, do us a favour. Make it happen. Come on, Facebook. Don't let us down. Oh, connection failed. Why have you done that? Facebook, what is going on? You're hurting my heart right now. I can't take this anymore. I can't take this anymore. Come on, Facebook. Do me a favour. Let me talk with this awesome human being. Unbelievable, Jeff. Unbelievable. So, let's try again. Let's push the button again. Do you know what I'm doing? No. <laughs> Do I know what I'm doing? Uh, do you know what? I'm just winging it, Mitch. Winging it. Taking as much progress and action as I possibly can. So that I fall forward. Just getting embarrassing now. 
thanks, Mitch. I pre- <laughs> appreciate your support as always. It is not happening. No, connection failed. Well, isn't this just the joy? Isn't this just the joy? So try one more time. Absolutely, Jerry. The analogy spot on. <laughs> right, right. It's working. Yeah, yeah. But you don't want to see my face. Bye. Bye. See ya. Right, that was my darling wife, sat next door, unexpectedly joining me Facebook Live. So it is working. Facebook Live does work. Brian's obviously thrown his phone out the window because I can't see it. <laughs> well, it's just you and I, guys. Let's have a, a wonderful chat about leadership and mindsets, shall we? Let's just imagine being in Costa Rica right now, surfing, thinking about leadership. Um, so yeah, here, here, if you have joined and you have joined every single one of my failed attempts at this interview, let me just say thank you for persevering. Let me just say thank you for bearing with me. Uh, and let me just apologise if I've wasted any of your time. There are 12 of you on right now and I'm so sorry that you're just sat here watching and listening to me. Um... I'm going to try bringing Brian on one last time. Um, we know that it works. We know that it works. Let's make it work. Adding. Hmm, a rogue wave. Let this be the... the the wave of all waves, the mother wave. Brian, let's, let's push this button. Come on, come on, Facebook. Facebook's playing hard to get. So, Brian, I'm approving your request several times, and it still says adding. So, this will be the last attempt before we try something very different, and we'll probably go live on, on Brian's profile. Um, request it again. Well, oh, this is fun, isn't it? This is fun. The conversation is going to be brilliant. It's just whether it stays between me and you or whether I can bring enough people with us to learn. Oh, wonderful. Still adding. Continuously adding, 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 adding. Not giving up, I will never give up, but I am going to stop. So, if you have joined in anticipation of a wonderful conversation, I still hope to have it in the future. Tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about how I met an awesome human being um, who was massively inspiring to me, and I thought I'd share him with the world, but Facebook wouldn't let me do it. It's. I'm not sure what type of story it is. Is it a is it a uh, is it a tragedy is it a is it a rocky is it a <gasps> holy cow yes what happened <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable wow fantastic i'm slightly hey, in shock you. now yeah me too i don't understand why or what i don't have sound but hey this is this is good can you hear me good to see you ryan I hear you. Do you hear me? Yeah. If you might, if you're able to put your headphones in, because I can hear my voice. 
Yeah, hold on one second. I, I don't want to mess anything up, but um, I got to fix something on the headphones. Uh, okay. And I may not. Yeah. I don't like. Oh no, I shouldn't have asked. Shouldn't should have messed with it. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? There we go. Yeah, my only issue is that my sound is not coming through my headphones. Ah. It's only coming through the speakers. Sod it. Let's just carry on. It is great to see you. Uh, even if he's paused. There we go. All right. I, I don't want to mess with this any further no, if I can. Uh, let's carry on. I have all the volumes up as much as I can. I apologize for that. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. I hear you, I hear you perfectly. Do you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's crack on. Mate, it is great to finally have you here with me. <laughs> Oh, uh, this this they've made us work for it, haven't they? You know that this is what six, um, seven, eight times. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'm I'm so pleased that you can finally join, and uh, just please do the honour of uh, introducing your good self. Yeah, so I'm uh, Brian Formato, and I run two companies. One called Groove Management, which is a human capital consulting firm, and the other is called LeaderSurf, and it's an experiential leadership development program which is 100% my passion play. Um, and I think it's the most powerful leadership development program I've ever experienced. And of course, I have some bias towards it. Absolutely. But uh, just like the struggle we just went through, you know, when there's struggle, there's learning. And the outcome of the struggle is that, yeah, the success tastes even sweeter. Mm. So I'm happy to be here with you today, Ryan. Amazing. Love that. So just uh, give us a little bit of an insight into who you are and a bit of your career. Yeah, so i um, born and raised in New York City in Manhattan. And so you'd think, what does a guy from Manhattan <laughs> know about surfing? Well, I guess as a city kid, uh, my skateboard was my favorite possession as a kid. And mm. to this day, at almost 50, I still like riding my skateboard around. Nice. Um, but part of it was this idea of, um, you know, the grass is greener. And growing up as a city kid, I always wanted a lifestyle that I didn't have, which was, you know, parks and playgrounds and being outside and the beach. And as a kid, I was fortunate in that we had a house, a summer home that was at the beach. And so at the age of about five or six, I learned to surf um, and just fell in love with the sport because it taught me courage. It taught me respect for mother nature. Mm -hmm. And you know, surfing is in a way, it, it really um, alone, it, it's you versus nature mm -hmm. or you in harmony with nature. And so learning to kind of harness the power of those waves and, um, it was a life lesson that I learned early on, and that has kind of guided me through my life. And uh, after growing up in New York, I went to school in Florida for undergrad. I really wanted to go to California, but my parents said <laughs> I'd become a surf bum and never, uh, never make anything in my life. So instead, I uh, went to school in Florida, um, was on the sailing team there, windsurfed, and I drove you know, um, pretty far to go surfing when, when I could mm -hmm. to get some waves. And then after that, moved back to New York and started a career first in investment banking. And it was probably the worst career choice I ever made. Um, yeah, lesson number one here is um, do what you love and the money will follow. Don't follow the money. Mm -hmm. uh, I followed the money. And I had studied leadership and um, management you know, development in undergrad. And then I got into a company where it was all about stepping on other people to get ahead. Mm -hmm. And so I, I left and... Um, started my career, you know, really in human resources and spent 22 years working for a number of different companies in learning and development and kind of traditional HR roles. Um, always with the hope that one day um, I'd step out and I'd start my own company to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's been five years full-time running my group management business and LeaderSurf um, was born out of an unmet need with a, a client a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so um, for a number of years, I, either inside companies or on my own, I've been running um, leadership development programs for cohorts within companies. Mm -hmm. 
And the idea being that, you know, building leadership capability within an organization, um, the best way and time to do it is before the person is put in a position of managing or leading mm -hmm. others, but that typically doesn't happen. We do this thing in every company where we promote the best doer to all of a sudden yeah. lead other people. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the skills and don't know what they're doing. Some figure it out and some don't. But the idea is by having programs, you help to smooth out the learning curve and accelerate it. Um, but what I found is that almost all these programs and the ones even that I designed were built for classroom learning. You sit under fluorescent lights, you have somebody that has expertise talk at you. And the better ones include some experiential elements mm -hmm. and some self-assessments and so forth. And so there, there's, there's pieces there. But I had a client for whom I was doing one of these emerging leader programs. Mm -hmm. And the feedback was, hey, this program's great. We love the interactions that the group was getting. But our senior team, our C-suite, um, we all have MBAs, but we haven't done anything to develop ourselves. And we're terrible at giving feedback. Could, and they asked me, could I put together a leadership program? For yeah. A couple day off. And I said, sure, I can. But I was already skeptical. I was thinking about the interactions that would happen in that classroom between these people, you know, role playing and trying on new behaviors, and then having to go back and work with those people. Mm. And I was like, I just don't see it working. So I suggested, I said, there's a bit of a paradox here. People learn better when they're surrounded by people they don't know mm -hmm. and more willing to take risks when they're around people they don't know than people they do know. Mm -hmm. You'd think you'd be more comfortable around those that know you, but in fact, um, you feel like you're being judged. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion to the CEO was, why don't we send each of your members of your senior team, including you, to a different public program where you'll be exposed to people from other companies and you'll learn you know, through that experience. And I said, great, we'll pay you to figure out where to send them. And so um, went and looked at a number of university programs and other um, leadership institutes and so forth. And I started collecting the syllabi. And I started looking at kind of what the curriculum looked like. And it was almost all identical. And not only was it almost all identical, but it hasn't changed mm -hmm. in my 20 something years of doing this. You know, it's send you to a conference center. They start off with some kind of icebreaker activities. You talk about leadership versus management, and then you do some role playing, some case studies. Somebody that wrote a book gets in front of the group and talks at you, and you know, and that's the end of day one. And day two is going to be more of the same. The real learning and what I found was so we sent people to these programs, and they came back, and I interviewed them afterwards and said, "So what did you learn?" And they said, "Well, I got a nugget or two here or there, but the real learning was actually the relationships I built with these people from other companies." Mm -hmm. I said, well, how did that unfold? They said, well, we'd go back to the hotel <laughs> and we'd have dinner and then we'd hang out at the bar and have drinks. Mm -hmm. And while we were having drinks, somebody's boss would send him an email at eight o'clock at night and say, yeah, this person sent me to this training and now they want me doing reports and doing work. Somebody says, I work for someone like that once and here's how I dealt with them. And so it was really the learning from each other, yeah. not from the teacher, yeah. was where the power was. And so they went through these programs. They told me that you know, it was the networking that was the most powerful piece. And so I continued to get requests from different companies to build these programs. And I started thinking about it. I was like, well, what if I could build a disruptive program, a non-traditional program that had that, first of all, that element of it's less about being leader-led or teacher-led. Mm -hmm. And it's more about creating a like you call it a learning tribe or you know, mm. a learning circle. And so the people that are going to participate are actually the ones that are bringing the knowledge and expertise and they're sharing their experiences and knowledge with one another and that that's foundational to the program. Then I started thinking about this whole notion of under the fluorescent lights and you know, artificial light and just that environment and how it doesn't allow people to let their guard down. Mm. I said, well, what if I could do this somewhere that people would want to go and want to be? I started doing some research, and what I kind of found out was that if you think about it, the way your brain reacts to new information and new experiences, especially if you travel. Travel tends to open not only certain receptors in our brain, but not only that, but our sight, sound, smell, all the different things that we take in. We're on much more heightened awareness when we travel. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, what if I could build a program that was a trip, that took people somewhere that they wouldn't traditionally go or hadn't been before, that there may be a better learning retention from everything they experience. Mm. I mean, I still go back, I remember the first time 
I ever left the country you know, when I was about 12 years old on a family <laughs> trip. And all the things that it made me appreciate about where I live and all the things that it made me say, wow, you know, it's kind of cool the way they do that. They mm -hmm. do it better there. So travel, learning circle. And then I started kind of thinking more about, you know, what are the things that people need to learn? And one of the skills or one of the competencies I think that's most important for leaders today, especially in this world where we hear so much about disruption, and disruptors, you know, kind of killing the incumbents, is risk-taking mm -hmm. and um, embracing failure. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about that. I was like, so how do you get business people to take more risks and to embrace failure? Well, you have to have them be willing to step outside their comfort zone and do something they haven't done before. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about, so when was the last time I learned a new physical skill? What was it? What if I could, as part of the program, teach with the idea that learning to surf is a new physical skill that people haven't done. Learning to be a leader is a new skill, right? It's a skill that you may think you know how to do, but the more time you spend doing it, the more you realize how little you actually know. Um, and so that was a big piece of this was, Let's get people to a place where they're out of their comfort zone and learning something new. And the best thing about surfing is that even the best surfers in the world wipe out every time they go in the water. Mm. And so embracing failure is learning. I look at it and say that companies that want to be more innovative have to associate failure with learning. And they have to look at it as this notion that experiments never fail. If I try something, whether it succeeds or fails, there's learning. Mm. And so that would open me up to trying new things and more things. I love that. And you know, back to that learning a new physical skill, that being comfortable, being uncomfortable piece is a big piece of building better self-awareness and self-knowledge. And so mm -hmm. the surfing piece definitely kind of played into that. Um, and then I did some research on bucket list items. What do people want to do before they die? And number one and two are usually either learn a foreign language or learn to play a musical instrument. After that, the list is kind of interesting. You've got you know, stuff like you know, skydive, drive a race car, but surfing tends to make the top 10 list almost every time. Mm. And it's a sport you can start doing at a very young age, and there are people in the water that are in their 80s. Mm. So you know, it's, it is accessible if you carve out the time for it. Yeah. So tropical location, this physical activity, learning community, where would we do this? So then I started thinking, well, got to be somewhere my target audience probably is going to be um, American business people to begin with. And so California, well, the water's cold and it's really far from the East Coast. East Coast, waves are too inconsistent. Hawaii would be great, but it's too expensive and too far. So Central America kind of won out. And um, my wife and I went and did a number of trips to kind of prospect different places. And where we ended up launching the program was in Nicaragua. And a lot of people don't know a lot about Nicaragua. And I thought that was one of the things that was appealing to it is that the stereotypes that you have about people and about things need to be broken. Mm -hmm. Nicaragua at the time, two years ago, was the safest country in Central America. Um, people didn't realize that. They all thought Costa Rica was. But mm -hmm. Nicaragua, by um, violent crimes and any other metric, um, was the safest. But it was also the poorest country, the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti. Wow. And so the standard of living there is super low, but on the happiness factor, after the Scandinavian countries, Nicaragua ranks as one of the happiest poor countries in the world. Mm. And so this idea of getting people that live in a materialistic society that are business leaders to go to a place that's the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, see how the other half live, but see that they're super happy with what they have and content. Mm -hmm. Wow, that could be a powerful kind of message for anybody. And so as I went down there and started to meet people, I was like, this is a tremendous place and there's so much to learn from these people who have so little. But one of the other components of leadership to me is this idea of servant leadership, mm -hmm. that leadership should not be a selfish act, but it should be a selfless act. And so leadership isn't about what you're doing for you. Leave the ego at home, mm -hmm. Or as I say, leave it at the airport if you go to leader serve. <laughs> Instead, it's about helping others. And so the best leaders are the ones that help others. So we built a day into the program where we go into the community and help others. 
in Nicaragua, as we ran the program, access to clean drinking water is a big issue. Um, they do a lot of farming and for, um, from the farming, there's a lot of runoff into the streams and rivers and it pollutes the water and the groundwater itself isn't all that good to begin with. But there are these $50 or so filters that this company Sawyer makes and they allow you to filter 100 gallons of clean drinking water a day. And if it's well maintained, this little plastic filter can last five years. Wow. So we go into villages, we install these bucket filters, we show them how to use them, we give you know, school supplies to the kids, and we have an opportunity to make a sustainable difference in people's lives. Mm. And so we did that for several programs. Last year, Nicaragua um, got into kind of a political mess where um, Daniel Ortega, who's their president, um, who was a freedom fighter during kind of the Sandinista you know, uprising years ago, all of a sudden has become everything that he fought against. Mm -hmm. And so he's become a bit of a dictator and it's created an internal strife and civil war, mm. which made it an unsafe place to go. So um, just like we struggled to get on today, I struggled to have to pivot. And it's back to that lesson that you learned in surfing, which is that the ocean is like a moving chessboard. Mm. It's constantly evolving and changing and you can't control the ocean. You can only control how you react to it. Mm. So my lesson through all this was, hey, I tried to do this program in Nicaragua. It worked great for a little while, but now I had to pivot. And so we have since moved it to Costa Rica. Costa Rica doesn't have a drinking water problem. The people that live there, um, their level of poverty is nowhere near as bad, um, but there's still needs. And so what we've found to do is to go into communities and to get kids playing outside rather than stuck on their phones or playing games, mm -hmm. we actually build and install swing sets. And so it becomes something that will stand there for a generation or more. It becomes a gathering place for kids to play and that we can point to and say, hey, as part of the Leader Surf program, we have our Leader Surf initiative where we're making a difference in the lives of others. And it's a fun kind of team building event for the day. So those are kind of the components of the program. What I found when I launched this was that I thought I had it figured out that I knew who my target market was. Mm -hmm. It was VP, director level people and enterprise companies you know, making you know, a good wage um, having a team of direct reports, probably aged 30 to 55, um, fitness lifestyle people that like to work out and do things, probably wear a fitness band or watch, and vacation to them. They'd rather go on an adventure than go sit on a beach and be pampered. So with Facebook and all these different platforms, you can build that profile and then you can market towards it. What I found was that I found people that were intrigued and interested but then they, in turn, had to go and sell their boss yeah. on sending them to the program. The boss was like, what, you want, to, you want me to pay for you to go to Costa Rica to go surfing for the week? And you're going to call that leadership? <laughs> no way. Mm -hmm. So we had to kind of get around the naysayers and that. But then what we found was that even if the boss was on board, HR then had to get on board. Mm -hmm. And it became a three-step sales process, and it didn't work so well. So now, instead, what we do is we target the decision makers. In a small company, it's the CEO who would be interested in either their own development or in investing in the development of people on their team. Or in larger companies, it's either the head of HR or the head of learning and development. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are looking for ways to boost the performance of people that are in key roles in their organization. And so the program is the furthest thing from kind of a vacation or a boondoggle. Mm -hmm. um, it's Sunday to Friday. When people land on Sunday, it, you know, it kicks off you know, full swing with us talking about who we are, why we're there, what we want to get out of it. And uh, we go till about nine o'clock on Sunday evening, start at 7 a.m. Monday morning. We eat all of our meals family style together. And I start off Monday mornings with a question to everyone at the table. If you weren't here right now, where would you be and what would you be doing? Mm. People say, oh, I'd be in our you know, Monday morning staff meeting. I'd be in carpool line leaving my kids off. I'd be in that ops call. And so I ask them to say, hey, take a time out and just reflect on your sitting by the palm trees on this nice veranda, eating great food, and your company's paying for you to get something out of this. You've got to appreciate the circumstances that you're in, mm. but you're not here just for fun. You're here for real learning. And so then we do an hour and a half classroom learning module um, on the first morning, you know, which really sets the stage about what makes for an effective leader. And I think there's a huge miss um, in terms of what people think about when mm. they think about leadership. So how would you answer um, that question? 
Yeah, so I have a really strong opinion because I've worked with, I've done 360 feedback with, I've experienced you know, the ego leader, I've experienced the charismatic rah-rah, let's go get him leader. Um, I believe that every single person on this earth has the capacity to be a leader and that they have what I call a groove, something that makes them better, special, or different, superpower. And as soon as they can figure out what that is, and the sooner they can, and that they can spend their time and energy leveraging that, that's when they really can emerge as a force. Mm. And so to me, the number one thing about differentiating great leaders from all other leaders is self-awareness. Mm. The best leaders that I've ever met know who they are you know, definitively. They know what their strengths are. And I use the Superman analogy. So they know that they can leap tall buildings in a single bound and that they have x-ray vision, et cetera. But just like Superman, they know what their kryptonite is. Mm. They know what the thing is that can derail them and what their weakness is. And this idea of not only knowing what your weakness is, but not being shy about it. Sharing your weakness with others is a sign of strength. I'm comfortable with what I don't know as much as I'm comfortable with what I do know. And if you believe in the goodness of people, you'll believe that more people will shield you from your weakness than use it against you. Yeah. And so a big piece of this journey that I think people need to go on around leadership development is getting to know yourself better and spending more time being introspective and gathering input and feedback from others. The third or the final evening of the LeaderSurf program, uh, which was an iteration because it wasn't in the first program because um, I wasn't sure that people would be comfortable enough to do it, but I've done it every program since and it's considered probably the piece that people love the most is we end on Friday morning, but on the Thursday evening before, after all the other festivities are done, we sit in a circle either you know, outside by a fire pit mm -hmm. or somewhere you know, that's kind of a soothing, cool spot to be. And I ask each person to share two things with every other person in the program. Over the week of getting to know them, what do they appreciate most about that person? And what advice do they have for that person to make them even better? And so how often in your life do you meet a group of strangers that you spend, you know, 10 hours a day with for five days, and then at the end of that, have these people, you know, give you this raw, you know, unfiltered feedback about you? And what people find is that a lot of it is not new. It's reaffirming of what they already knew, but it's like, it's like shine a brighter light on those things, because here, here it is coming up again. People are telling you that... You, you got to believe more in yourself than you do because they see it. Mm. And then on the advice piece, yeah, that advice is usually for people to, to own who you are mm -hmm. and to not have regrets about, you know, about those things. You know, it's the self-confidence yeah. that starts with self-awareness. And the more aware you are, the more confident you can be in yourself. Um, I do a lot of work with startup companies and you know, with the investment community. And what I've found from venture capital companies is they invest less in the idea and more in the people. Mm -hmm. And so it's more about your ability to articulate your vision of where you want to go and do it in a way that gives confidence that you can get there. Yeah. That's where the investment dollars chase. You know, great ideas, that's one thing. It's easier to come up with ideas than to execute on them. Mm -hmm. And so if people are going to put their money behind you, they want to believe that you can make it happen. You said at the so start. Getting people to have confidence. Yeah. Sorry, you, you said at the start around um, pursue what you love and the money will follow. What's the um, what's the practical advice behind that? Where do people start? So I know a few people that come to mind that, you know, have they're in investment banking. They've been chasing it mm -hmm. and they've been miserable and they've hopped company to company to company and they've made decent money, but they've had a life of misery. Mm -hmm. And then I know other people that kind of said, you know what, I'm going to throw in the towel on that. And I've always loved photography. I'm going to go and do something with photography. Mm -hmm. And that person that pursued photography recognized that, you know what, all those investment bankers need headshots. And use their investment banking connections to then turn that into a really viable business. Mm -hmm. But they were doing something they loved on their own schedule, on their own time. And then they looked at, so what are my superpowers and strengths? Well, one of the strengths that they had was the network that they built. And so they were able to turn you know, what they loved doing and find the cross-section where it 
crisscrossed with you know, their network and what else they had um, you know, as an asset to them. And so I think people need to think and spend a little bit more time um, gathering data and thinking about how do I reframe you know, who I am? Because mm -hmm. we define ourselves so much by what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and we allow that to, to creep into who our personality is. Mm -hmm. When we kick off the LeaderServe program, um, I make certain that I don't send out who's coming in advance because I don't want people to go on LinkedIn and know the job titles and the companies and so forth. I want people to introduce themselves. It's like starting a new school you know, mm -hmm. or joining the witness protection program. You, you're, you're incognito when yeah. you get there and you get to frame yourself however you want. And the question I ask when we do intros then in the formal setting is instead of where do you work and what's your job title, it's what do you get paid to do? Mm -hmm. And the real question behind what do you get paid to do is what value do you create? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to hear how people struggle with answering that without going back to, well, I'm the vice president of customer success. <laughs> no, what do you get paid to do? Yeah. I get paid to make certain that our customers are delighted so that they buy more of our product. Great. Love that. Yeah. What do you get paid to do? I get paid to help people, to hold the mirror up to people, to help individuals and organizations see things that they didn't see in themselves mm. and then get them to take those things that they now learned about themselves and leverage them to maximize their performance. Mm. And I think my group management mission statement kind of says it well. It's, to help individuals and organizations to maximize performance by focusing on their strengths. Mm, yeah, I love that. I love that. What advice? Would, I mean, I'm I'm very passionate about helping develop the next generation of leaders, and I think I think there's going to be an issue at some point in the future where our young people are entering the workplace and they're going to have such lack of self esteem, self confidence through you know comparing themselves to other people on social media, seeking external validation in things outside of them, and you know I'm really keen to try and write that you know now and, and help develop the next generation of, of leaders what advice would you give to you know someone that is you know high school age yeah. just looking to develop their own uh, leadership capacity for the future yeah so two things one um a colleague of mine that helped me with the leader surf program uh, martha williams told me this quote i had never heard it before and i'll never forget it because it sticks with me and i think about it every day it was that um, comparison is the thief of happiness. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard that before. I was shocked that I'd never heard it because it's so simple, but it's so mm -hmm. true that we spend in this social media world of Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook. It's all about, you know, posturing an image that isn't you know, real. And so this idea of forget about the comparison, um, the way that I look at it is that Leadership is about individuality. Mm -hmm. There is only one Ryan on this planet, and that gives you superpowers that no one else mm -hmm. has, whether it's all the good things that have happened to you or all the shit you've been through, because mm -hmm. we've all been through bad things, yep. right? Nobody's had it easy. Um, but those are the things that give us superpowers, is that we are all individuals, and that you know, if you treat leadership as there's no other leader like me in the world, if instead you try to emulate the behaviors of others, what you do is that, like, cheating yourself out of your own power. Because you're like, it's an, I want to be like that person. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, and I think it starts when you're, when you're a teenager you know, or in high school, and it's like, choose your own path. And yes, mm -hmm. your parents will want to influence what your path is, but... You know, have the fortitude to you know, have a point of view. Um, I found that I defined success the wrong way earlier in my life mm -hmm. because I thought that it really was about, you know, material things, mm -hmm. money, cars, etc. Mm -hmm. You can't take that with you. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the older I get, the more I see it as it's the experiences, it's the relationships. Um, I would pay to go to Leader Surf every time just to be able to meet the people that I get to meet and work with mm. that are there. I feel very spoiled because every one of those programs, I learn as much as everyone else that's there. Mm. Because once again, it's a learning community. And my job really is tour guide or facilitator, um, but no two groups are the same. And so going back to you know, that person that's in high school, it's 
don't be constrained by what other people define as success. Mm. Um, it would be good to, um, to kind of try a bunch of different things. I know so many people that thought they wanted to do one thing, you know, <laughs> applied to a college that had that specialty, and then a year later wanted to transfer and go somewhere somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I think we all pivot, we all make mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I kind of look at recently saw the movie The Founder, which was about mm -hmm. um, Ray Kroc and McDonald's. And what I loved most about the movie was that he was over fifty when he finally had success with it, right? Kind of miserable guy, you know, stole some other people's idea, et cetera. So there's some stuff there, but the truth is that it's never too late to start or to do something else. Um, you know, for me, this was kind of a second career. Um, and the reason that I was able to do it was that I created enough of a safety net. So I can't discount the fact that People do have bills to pay and you know, have to put food on the table and so forth. Um, but I see people that are much happier and more content in their life that are doing things that they love to do than people that are killing it at work financially but you know, are pretty miserable yeah. and go home with that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, part of how I got into all of this was um, my grandfather, Alan Frommy, was a famous uh, psychologist. He was on a lot of talk shows and stuff back in kind of the 50s and 60s. And um, he was the, a, wrote a number of books and he was a psychologist to a lot of CEOs. Mm -hmm. And they were seeking his counsel because they were super successful at work and complete train wrecks in their personal lives, right? Married three or four times, their kids didn't want to talk to him. They drank too much. They had all sorts of issues. And it was because they were married to their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so his whole thing was about helping them strike balance, find ways. And as a result of that, it also improved their performance at work. And so originally I thought, well, wow, that's kind of cool. Maybe I want to be a psychologist. And then I learned a little bit more about sociology. And then I learned even more about organization development and IO psychology. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? Those people that have all these problems... We all have all those types of problems. They may have them worse, but any team in any work environment has that negative synergy of all the crap that we carry with us. These people come to work and then it feeds the problems that happen at work. Mm. So I said, rather than helping individuals, what if I could help people in a corporate setting mm. to be more engaged, more content, feel a sense of belonging, build stronger team relationships, yeah, you know, and if you look at what it takes to be a successful team, it starts with trust. You have to have tension and friction. Teams that don't have <laughs> tension and friction, I worry about because I look at them and say, if you don't care, then you don't have tension and friction. The person I fight with the most is my wife. It's because we care, right? So you don't fight with people that you don't care about or about issues that you don't care about. And so Google kind of did this whole study with 180 teams and said psychological safety is the number one thing that you know, drives team performance. Yep. If people can show up and be themselves and be authentic. And so I'm all about authentic leadership and getting people to be able to be authentic. Mm. And if you don't feel that you can be that where you're currently working, um, you know, then you're robbing yourself of an opportunity to make a difference. Yeah, I love that. Are there any um, other le lessons in leadership that you've learned over your, um, over your journey? Yeah, I mean, there. I've worked for some really good bosses and some really bad bosses. I think I've worked for more bad bosses than good bosses. Um,
Yo, so technical problems continue to to plague. Um, we've just had an awesome conversation with Brian. Uh, we finally had episode 27 and then it's cut me off. So what I wanted to do is just give Brian the opportunity to to summarize and to wrap up. So um, let me just hopefully we will get straight on um, and then we'll just give Brian the opportunity to to wrap up. There we go. Sorry about that, my friend. <laughs> I don't know, but hey, we, we, we got most of it. <laughs> there we go. The, the most important thing is we have not lost the original video. I have saved that as we speak, so that is safe. Um, I don't know where, where were we? When, when, did, when did I lose you? We were talking about um, the, the board. And... Yeah, getting hit in the face with the board, and that be careful what you tether to, and uh, yeah, that the surfboard is both your friend and your enemy. And, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, he, I think we got the gist of it, which is that, you know, this metaphor, I mean, we surf the web every day. There's, there's the surfing, surfing has gone mainstream and it's in all of our lives in the vernacular. And it also, it's going to be an Olympic sport in um, 2020, which is kind of cool Amazing. for the first time ever. Amazing. I love that. Uh, and, yeah. and, and let me yeah. just say a um, huge thank you to you. Thank you to you for joining. Um, um, as I said at the very start of the original live, um, you know, when I saw that leader surf account, like, like one of my posts, I was like, this has got to be too good to be true. And it's just been an absolute pleasure to, to hear more from you and, and hear, hear more about the, the mindset behind it. Because, it, I mean, here's what I see. Um, it's two of my favorite things in the entire world, surfing and leadership. And I just think, actually, that, if, you, if, you, if you've seen my most recent post, I think I think it represents exactly what I've said, which is about if you show up with purpose, if you show up with what you believe and your belief that actually it's a great leadership experiential learning program, um, the right people will show up and the right people will want to take advantage of that. And then there will be, I think you said this before, a tipping point. But like you say, it's, you're being disruptive, but actually, you know, I'm just glad that you're doing it. I'm glad that you're you're leading the way. You're setting an example. Uh, I hope to one day be able to experience leader surf. It w yeah, I was going to say, I would, Ryan, I would love for you to come and experience the program firsthand. And for anyone else that watches this video live or later on, to go to leadersurf.com where you can learn more about the program. Because um, there's testimonials from people. You know, it's in my eyes. Yeah, I'm biased. I I, I absolutely mm -hmm. love it, but. Um, we have a really high repeat rate of companies that have sent people that say, hey, this is re really working magic for our people. We're going to yeah. continue to. Um, you know, and there have been a couple people that have actually done it on their own dime um, because they just were so convicted to, I want to get better as a leader and I want to do it through an interesting way. Love that. I love that. And um, I guess you've, you've alluded there to, to your Leader Surf website. How else can people connect with you? Yeah, well, they can reach out to me on, on, on Facebook. Um, they can email me at brian at leadersurf as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, this is what I, I, I love talking about this. So I appreciate you, you know, creating the platform and the opportunity. We'll have to get Zuckerberg to figure out how to make this work <laughs> a little bit more quickly. But, we had know, to work for it, didn't we? They're too busy selling our data. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So Leadersurf website, you're on Instagram as well? Yes, Instagram, LeaderSurf um, account there as well. Facebook, Instagram, um, there's a LinkedIn page for it as well. Um, yeah, and, and we're always interested in hearing other people's take on it. Um, we welcome guest blog posts as well. Um, yeah, we've typically had just people who have attended the program mm -hmm. that have done some writing about their experience, um, which has been super. I mean, we're just one of the participants from the past program that we just finished in November. Um, was interviewed about her business um, for a magazine and talked about her leader surf experience. Amazing. I love that. And um, I, I think if you ever wanted to come and do one in Newquay in England, then I'd be more than happy to, uh, to, to set you up with that one as well and, 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 and run it from the UK on your behalf. Not a problem. <laughs> that sounds cool. I've been looking at Lofoten in Norway, so I don't know, maybe uh, UK be a little warmer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I love it. Um, could you please leave us with a, a final thought from yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back to self-awareness is, you know, is everyone's superpower? And mm -hmm. that's what's going to differentiate um, you as a leader. Don't give that power to others by trying to emulate them. Mm -hmm. Figure out what your secret sauce is. 
Um, and there should be no shame. You know, I think this whole notion of being judged by others, um, judgment often is rooted in jealousy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've got to believe in yourself in order to get, in order to get others to believe in you. Um, and you can build really positive momentum around it. And if you're surrounded by a bunch of negative people, um, you know, go find another spot to serve. <laughs> you know, find, find some people that bring positivity um, to your surroundings and to your everyday. Love that. Love that. Brian, thank you so much. You're a gentleman. You're an inspiration to me. Um, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your week. Thank you for uh, bringing okay, your, your time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Brian. Fantastic. Speak to you soon. Bye now, Brian. Bye.